Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. <coughs> and thank you very much for the or to the organisers for inviting me to this excellent conference. I don't have a background at all in uh, fashion or textiles. My professional background is in political, social and organisational research. I've done research for both major political parties in Australia and published a book about what makes for successful leadership in a multicultural Australia. But I mention all this mainly to show that I was settled nicely in a career in consulting with quite a lot of cross-cultural focus. In 1991, 1999, a friend suggested that we take a trip together to India. And in fact, I was a bit reluctant at first. I found the idea of India a bit daunting. And I also had a heritage that I felt I didn't know enough about. And therefore, I felt a bit reluctant to come. Because in fact, for me, it was a return. I'd been to India as a child of six and again as a child of 10 to stay with my grandparents. My mother was born and raised in Mumbai and um, somehow or other, 40 years went by from the age of 10 before I came back to India again. But I was smitten when I came. I was both captured and captivated to pick up Sadhguru's words from yesterday. It was a sort of soft power seduction um, my friend was, felt exactly the same, and so we said to each other, we've got to try and find a way of coming back. We'd both bought clothes when we were here, um, lovely cotton clothing made from hand-woven cotton. When we got home, we said to each other, have you been wearing those clothes? And we both said, well, I only wear them when I'm at home, because they don't fit terribly well, and the colours don't suit the harsher Australian light but it's such a lovely fabric to wear. So surely we could do something about the fabric. Surely we could design a range of clothes that use this lovely fabric. So um, we pitched the idea at we, women who like to wear natural fibers, uh, women who were interested in design, they wanted their clothes to be a, you know, a bit designed, but not over designed. And the most important motive was that we wanted to come back to India every year. Uh, we haven't got the first slide up. So what have I learnt in almost two decades of coming to India? We're not working. There we are. First, it's important to set it in the context of the times. Australians were very warmly disposed towards India. Many of my contemporaries had been hippies in the 60s and made trips here. But the image of Indian clothing in general was of poor quality. It's a bit cheap, it's a bit nasty, falls apart at the seams, fades in the light. It's a bit young and it's a bit hippie. In comparison with, say, Japan and even China, the general perception was a bit shoddy in the workmanship and not much design. And I'm talking here of mainstream perceptions. A few people knew of the superlative work that is done in India, but these were a minority. But Sue, my partner, and I were keen on the Japanese aesthetic, the minimalist look, clean lines, plenty of black. People in Melbourne wear black all the time. So we thought we could overcome the perceptions of hippie, cheap Indian clothing if we gave our garments a japanese Western look while using these beautiful cottons. So we mostly used Mangalgiri and Maheshwari and then the brilliant myriad techniques that you find throughout India, little details of kantha stitching, um, indigo dyeing, uh, hand block printing and bandani scarves and so on. Um, we, we had to, I'm going to just skip a bit here, to help overcome the negative perceptions, we made sure our swing tags and our labels looked very smart and elegant and restrained. We adopted uh, the idea of exhibition come sale, which I know you do in India quite a lot, but ours were invitation-only events, 
and um, that was to give a sort of air of exclusivity to it. And we, we described the clothing as limited edition clothing, a bit like books. And we advertised in the books and arts pages of the local newspapers and in the art gallery magazines. Um, by these means, we were trying to overcome what was an existing rather negative perception of Indian clothing. But most importantly, um, I'll just show you that was you know, the sort of invitation we did. Um, this is some of the scarves. That's the, actually the one I've got on. Um, and there should have been a picture of our swing tag, but... Uh, was there? Oh, okay, I'll go back to that. Um, what we, we began to recognise was that ours was an educational role. This was very important. We hadn't realised that this would happen. It wasn't a strictly retail role. We knew we had to educate our customers so they understood that hand-woven or handmade goods take a long time, that they can be unpredictable. And this is what was printed on the back of these swing cakes. We said, Moti uses only natural fibres. Handwoven fabrics are idiosyncratic. They may contain charming irregularities. We had to provide a narrative, a new narrative for our customers. And this was an educational experience for us, first of all. We had to learn about the techniques that were in order to explain them to customers. And this learning was a large part of the pleasure we had in coming to India. And I think we conveyed our pleasure to our customers. They told us it added to the experience of shopping with us, and hence it added to the perceived value of the goods. It really value added. <clears throat> gave an, it was an intangible value, a soft power value. In some ways, it was a commercial limitation for us. It meant that ours was a very personal business, not one that was easy to replicate, nor easy to wholesale. But all in all, our business was about... Um, it was not just a material transaction. It was primarily about relationships, about personal relationships we made here, the friendships we made, the things we learned about people's lives that we would never have learned if we'd just been tourists. So in ge I'm not going to go through all of this, but in general, what's charming in these charming irregularities, what's charming? The allure of India. Most of it everyone would generally know about. Um, there are, I think the general perception of India is that it's, it's, a, it's a gentle place. Um, there's a positive backdrop to India, that it has soul, there's something indefinable. There are deeper meanings in everything, including in the food, as we talked about this morning. Um, for Australians, of course, there was a shared political system, we're both federations, we both have parliamentary democracies, a similar legal system, both derived from our British colonial past. And the fact that English is widely spoken here, of course, makes doing business much easier uh, than perhaps the other options might have been, such as Vietnam or China. The food, of course, is a, an ambassador for India <clears throat> and everything else about it that tourists know well. Um, but beyond the sort of touristic charms, to pick up what Jonathan said this morning, in, uh, earlier this afternoon in his talk, the kindness, the caring, the genuine warmth and generosity of Indians is just astonishing and warms your heart every time you're here. Um, all of the other things, the diversity, the, the diversity of handcrafts, um, the accidental encounters, and above all, the sense of humour. We have an awful lot of fun when we're here, which is such a pleasure. There are, of course, less charming irregularities. Um, it should be this one. Um, people are very nervous about coming to India in general, as, as probably everyone knows. You hear all the time, I'd love to go to India, but I'll never cope with the noise, I'll never cope with the crowds, I'll never cope with the poverty, I'll get sick. Um, and, and getting a visa is some sort of whimsical process. It seems to vary every year. Um, but so, so those are the sort of general roadblocks. 
The difficulties for us were things like uh, the reluctance to say no. We had a lot of difficulty with things that, that didn't turn up because people were too nervous to tell us they hadn't been able to do it. Um, sending, we, we rarely got a shipment that didn't have something wrong, wrong in it. Um, but on the whole, all the advantages, the art advantages far outweighed the disadvantages. We had to learn to be patient. That's probably the main thing we had to learn. Handmade goods are completely humbling, I think, and that was a very important recognition. Um, we, had to, we had to really focus on this educational role. We had, to we had to learn constantly and we had to pass that on to our customers. And this helped facilitate the, the sort of soft power of what we were doing to overcome the negatives, to change the narrative. Um, I won't go into all of these because I know we've got short of time, uh, but I'll just flick through the sorts of things we needed, perhaps. One of the key things was that people found it really difficult to believe that there could possibly be no one at home in Australia. I mean, in India, there's always someone around the house. And so <laughs> deliveries would come without giving us any notice. And of course, there was nobody there. And it then cost us a lot more to get them out of some awful storage place. Um, Oh, this was, I um, um, have been working on a manuscript about my family heritage and, and this was uh, the cover, my son did a mock-up of a cover for it. Um, summing up, there's, I think it illustrates the notion of successful soft power being something that co-opts rather than coerces that persuades, that educates, that doesn't bully, that doesn't use economic might or sheer numbers to overwhelm. India has sheer numbers en route to overtaking China soon, but I doubt it'll ever be perceived in Australia as anything other than a constructive partner, a country from whom we have much to learn and hopefully much more to share than beyond cricket and curry. Um, most people in Australia are unaware of the extent to which India has a very sophisticated fashion and design industry. Many of your leading designers are using traditional techniques, adding handwork details, using natural fibres, natural dyes and so on. People overseas see Bollywood, they see flashy, they see bling, and at the other end of the scale they see the cheap end, the hippie end, but they don't see this, that the the revival, the reworking of traditional textiles, embroidery and block printing. They don't see the sophisticated reinterpretation of traditional lines that's going on in Indian fashion and the subtle use of traditional techniques. There is, I believe, a huge opportunity here to showcase this new restrained and subtle Indian textile and fashion scene, a new era of fashion soft power. Thank you.